All right, let's dig right in. Our guest today is Corey Kogan, the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of the book, The Five Choices to Extraordinary Productivity, written with her colleagues and friends, Adam Merrill and Lena Renee. Corey Kogan, welcome to Great Life, Great Career. Thank you, Scott. So great to be here today. Now, Corey, occasionally we have our listeners rate and review and talk about the guests they love the most. You were one of our first guests back, gosh, six, seven months ago when we hosted our program at Skull Candy up in Park City, Utah, the maker of the famed headphones and accessory advices where we interviewed their CEO. And you came and talked briefly about one of the many books that you've written. We have you back today for the full hour on this ever-present issue in our life around productivity, right? Managing our time, managing our priorities. You are arguably one of the foremost thought leaders, if not the world's expert, on time management for the 21st century. Before we get to that topic, I want to ask you, what is it like to be a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, the author or co-author of multiple books, you're jet-setting around the world, keynoting at major conferences on stage with big names and as are you? What's it like to have been transformed in the last you know, half decade from someone like all of us that can relate to, to this person of pretty significant fame? Well, thanks for asking that, Scott. And first of all, it's a great honor to have been invited to participate in this, to be on this program, (laughs) uh, to be an author, and, um, you know, proud of the fact that I have the experience under my belt to be able to uh, do that. I think it's important, um, as that person now, I'm just a regular person. So it's, uh, I think that's the real key to this, is not changing because of all that fame, not necessarily fortune, but all that kind of... (laughs) <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But what an honor to go around the world and be able to speak with, you know, pretty high level leaders and people and make the contribution to have people, you know, do something different in the areas that I cover with them. Uh, that That's probably the most important thing. And uh, you are, you, I saw on the internet where you are one of the main keynotes at the World Business Forum this fall in New York City on the stage, which such luminaries as Janet Yellen, right? Who's the former, you know, lead of the Fed, that's an exciting platform. When you get in front of five, 6,000 CEOs and business leaders, how do you prep? Well, I think that's some of, uh, you know, the success and credibility is around the prep. It's, uh, I'm excited about it. I, I do not have a fear of public speaking. Right. Again, knowing that I have the ability, particularly in my own hood, you know, being born and raised in New York City. Right. Uh, that, you know, with, with thousands, it's, your audience. it's my audience yeah. and I know they're going to leave there going, Hey, I can do something different tomorrow. That's going to make my life better and help me go to sleep at night. Uh, you know, feeling more accomplished and it's going to affect my organization. That's it's it's something that I think is common with all of our guests is when you have paid the price, you've, you've done the reps on a particular topic and you feel like you've got some expertise. It comes natural on stage, right? You just kind of just let it it, it comes natural, and it's because of deep listening during each and every one to what's really going on in the real world with these people, whether individuals on their own or leaders, and continuing to learn and fold their stories into how I, you know, give them back the story to help them continue to improve. So let's talk about the theme today, the future of productivity. In this book, The Five Choices to extraordinary productivity, you have a central theme with your authors, which is sort of this idea of decision, attention, and energy. Talk about why that's so important to understanding how we get control of our time and become more productive. Well, when you think about time management uh, many years ago, it was, oh, how do I manage? How do I get everything done? And it was very industrial age oriented. Meaning, uh, you know, it was an eight-hour day. I mean, it started back with the assembly line. It was just a very routine, manual labor, got to get things done. Uh, And so the optimization was around how do I get manual labor done, hands back, all that kind of stuff. In today's world, it's, it's, it's a knowledge world. We're all paid to think, to innovate, to create and execute. And it's all about optimizing mental labor. So... So it's not about how do I, what do I do with every minute of the day, but it has to be around time management today has to be around how do I, in the midst of all the craziness, make the highest value decisions with everything coming at me all day long, which are tiny decisions all day long. How do I stay focused, attention management? How do I stay focused on those things that are, which are, are most important and don't get distracted when there's industries built to distract us? And then in this world of globalness, 24-hour day, everything, how do I have the energy to make sure I get the right things done? So decision management, 
attention management and energy management. You could argue that everyone now has ADD because like you said, the onslaught of choices and information coming at us is profound. What's a practical tip you would give someone when it comes first to making wise decisions with their time and their energy? Any, any ideas you'd share with us around the decision side? Well, there's a host of things and there's some prep work you know, with that as well. So a lot of this is the why before the what. And so one of the key things is really to, to making high value decisions is understanding how the brain works. So I'm just taking a couple of minutes, take a deep breath here. There's a few uh, principles. The organizing principles for the brain is it does two things. It avoids threat and it looks for reward. In that order, doesn't change. And so with that, you have two parts to the brain. Back of your brain is the reactive part. It's where it keeps you alive. It routinizes everything. And so any unknown, any threat, it, it doesn't want any threat. The front of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, is where you do your intentional thinking. And that's my favorite word when it comes to this is being intentional. So there's the first tip that I can't just unconsciously answer every me email and respond to every person, do all that kind of stuff, because you just, by rote doing that, I need to get very intentional, get into my prefrontal cortex, so that I am now intentionally and consciously making the decision on each and everything that is incoming. Is that the most important thing I should be doing? It is it Scott Miller coming at me for the 17th time, asking me to help him with the same old thing, or is it somebody brand new that needs my attention? I need to put stuff down because that's most important. So that's a start as to how to think about making the highest value decisions. Let's move quickly. It's helpful, Corey, to talk about this notion, this important you know, lens between importance and urgency, right? I mean, for 30, 40 years, Franklin Covey's talked about this concept. You've brought it really into a practical, I think, light in your book, The Five Choices. Talk about, in the context of professionals, the difference between living in an urgency paradigm versus an important paradigm. So this is really a big topic because, because we're using our brain, people don't know what's important and what's not. They assume everything is important. And they think that that means that everything needs to be done right now. So in organizations, even in families, people feel like, oh my gosh, they're killing me. I got to do this. They gave me 12 things to do. I got to do it. When in fact, maybe whoever gave it to you had no intention of you doing it right this minute. We just assume that. Their, or their delivery might have artificially elevated it to being right now, right now. It might have been. Yeah. But the goal, again, because we're using our brain and we all interpret things differently, there has to be a language and a methodology. There needs to be a safe word or a code or something whereby we are able to discern what's important, less important, not important for myself, between two or more people, or for a team or an organization and make that measurable. So Can we just I use get the same safe the word at home as I'd use in the office, or it's a different one? That's a different, different one. Different concept. Okay. okay, sorry. Keep going. Yeah, so, so that's it. We need this language and a methodology, which yeah. you know we have, uh, so that people are really clear on what's important and what's not, and have uh, a, a platform to be able to question, wait a minute, do I, do I need this right now? Do I need to do this right now or not? Is it urgent or is it not? And we get really clear on the language around that. We're talking today with Corey Kogan, the Wall Street Journal bestselling author, international speaker, and really expert advisor to executives around the world, the lead author of the bestselling book, The Five Choices, The Path to Extraordinary Productivity. Corey, in my career, I think it's fair to say I have been a bit urgency addicted. I think part of that is just my personality of being kind of anxious and motivated and productive. But I also think, after reading your book, I'm a bit of a product of the corporate culture that rewards being urgent and, and always putting kind of putting out fires when I can't tell you the last time that I've seen someone reward someone who maybe, you know, um, was more prepared or prevented the fire, right? The gift cards and the meetings are always, you know, being recognized from someone. What role do leaders have, organizations have in helping people like me who have learned to thrive in urgency move my whole value proposition, if you will, to become focused on what's important. This is totally, the leaders can make or break their organization's productivity and reve revenue generation 
by owning this language and methodology around what's important, less important, not important, and some of the behaviors that they have had for 100, 100 years, that if they would just change a little bit, would, even if you never hired another staff person again, would increase the productivity of your organization many fold. The answer to that is, first of all, there's two things. On the individual level, we are addicted to urgency because we, it's a drug, it's a drug addiction. Your brain, you know, you're waiting to the last minute to do something that, or you want that dopamine hit uh, that goes right to the reward center and the adrenaline that drives you. And there's some of that is good, but here's the point. If you wait to the last minute to do something, you are never doing your best work. Whether it's a project you're working on, a sale you're trying to close, a conversation you're trying to have with a child, it doesn't matter. You wait to the last minute you're not going to do your best work. That should scare people half to death. Back to the leader, it is. In organizations, it is. Hey, let's reward, you know, hey, Scott, got that, you know, the, the sale, save the customer, got the system back or up. Drove Yay. the package three well, hours it's, it's, through the night or through five the hours night, through the night. And yeah. it's the heroics and the firefighting, and we reward that. So that's, re- people crave recognition. So people are looking around at that and saying, wow, I, I, could, I could use some of that. And then, so they, they either create a crisis or everybody is waiting till the last day of the quarter to finish it up or, you know, whatever. I think that that is, the reason we do that, we continue to do that is because what, it's what we know, but it's not as, you know, rewarding preventive, you know, root cause analysis. It's like, woohoo, Scott Miller, root cause analysis. Whoa, way to go doesn't feel as sexy right, as, right. hey, he drove through hours through the night. Right. If leaders would start behaving that, let's reward Scott because we had a crisis and he found the solution that we're never going to have that crisis again. Let's give him a million dollars because it's worth it to the company. So in our professional lives, you're putting a fair amount of responsibility at the feet of the leader to say it's her or his job to kind of protect their team from outside urgencies, but also not create their own and be part of the problem themselves. Yes. So outside urgencies, not be part of the problem and create them themselves. And the rest of the people also have to play because they're assuming everything needs to be done now. And that's not true either. So Corey, let's speak before we go to break directly to the leaders that are listening to our program today, whether they're leaders of a small team, a division, a platform, a company, whatever it is, as they're becoming more introspective, listening to our program right now on podcast or here on iHeartRadio, and they're thinking, gosh, you know what? I am part of the problem. I realize that my own compulsion to firefight and get things done is transforming over to the culture of my team, transferring over. What are some things today that a leader can do to recognize they're part of the problem and to start to build a culture that isn't urgency addicted? So the first thing that they can do is get together with their team and really come clear on what's important, less important. Maybe admit the important. fact that, guys, I've been in this urgency mode and I want to change. I want to change, change, but, we, but you, got to, you got to identify, get everybody on the same page. Here's the things that are really important. So no matter what, we're going to get those things done because everybody's perception of what's important is different. Once we do that, now you can start stripping away some of the waste. And some of that waste is making sure that you as a leader are not, and this happens so many times, like you said, that they are not accidentally throwing people or, or consciously throwing people into quadrant one. Leaders do not wake up in the morning going, huh, how do I make them miserable today and over busy? It just happens naturally. And, um, and, and I say that with fun because we just don't have these conventions. And so, and another example, a leader might text their people at night at 10 o'clock at night. And those people are crazy. Cause I'm, am I supposed to answer that? Am I not supposed to answer that? So we got to get these conventions. Don't throw people into quadrant one unless it's an absolute ne- necessity. Cause that's going to happen too. So the third thing, um, I, I, I also want to say, you've got to be clear with your teams that things are not quadrant one. This is a big lesson I learned with my team because I was sending things out and they would be back on my de- desk the next day. And I'm like, what, what, why? I didn't need that now. Corey, give everybody some context for this quadrant one, quadrant two you talk about. 
so um, yeah, sorry. So so the methodology that's really important to implement, whether it's your family, a team, or an organization, is what we call the time matrix. It's the confluence of the word urgent and important put together. And when you do that, for all of the incoming that's coming in, very consciously discern based on those quadrants, if it's important and urgent, it's a quadrant one. It's necessary to do right now. Give me some examples of something in a quadrant one. The IT system went down. The, okay. the, the, the sale at the last day of the quarter. Right. The, you know, all that. Any crisis. I got to take. Un- My kid's sick at school. I, I need to go there. Take, right. right. That, those are all necessary things that need to be done now. That quadrant gets overcrowded because we think everything needs to be done now. Quadrant three, urgent and uh, not important. It's a quadrant of distraction. We're uh, helping people all the time, uh, unproductive meetings. We're just sort of wasting time. Quadrant four, not urgent, not important, is a quadrant of waste. We go there when we're completely burnt out. It's pure excess. Game it's, of Thrones. It's uh, uh, No, it's not. It's Game of Thrones if you're sitting watching it for 12 hours because you're too burnt out to move. So some quadrant four is appropriate. It, it's not quadrant four. It's not important, not urgent. I see. Relaxation, taking a break, is okay. really important. You want to watch a couple hours of Game of Thrones and because that relaxes you and then you get on to something yeah. else? That's great. And that that's a big stumbling block for organizations. Oh, they can't they shouldn't be looking at Facebook or they shouldn't watch television. Baloney. I love television. It relaxes me. And some people checking their wall relaxes them. It's the time allotted to it that and going back to doing more important things. So just be mindful of when it's reparative and when it's becoming unproductive. And when it's becoming unproductive. Right. right. And and, and I, you can't leave this show going, oh, Corey said it's it's not. It's, it's based on your world. And then quadrant two, important, uh, not urgent, are those things that are most important. So you want to go there and you want to mitigate or eliminate as much of those other three quadrants. So productive and influential leaders are always striving to be in quadrant two. They need to be in quadrant one sometimes, but they're thinking about being in quadrant two, what is important, but not urgent. The the international global average in an ongoing study that we do shows that standing operating procedure shows that people feel like they spend 60% of their time on important things and 40% on unimportant things. It's standard operating procedure that people feel like they're wasting half their time. Leaders need to help move that needle. We're headed to break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Corey about, as leaders, how do you practically begin to create a culture of productivity? How do you be the transition figure for them? She's also going to debunk this idea of multitasking and kind of bring some practicality to what should we be trying to accomplish, set some realistic goals for our life, and feel fulfilled. You're listening to Scott Miller, host of Great Life, Great Career. We'll be right back with Corey Kogan. Corey Kogan. 